we're going to have a fun class about uh, Little Shop of Horrors. You can put it in your, <laughs> you can put it in your own yard. Uh, and our Master Gardener, Extension Master Gardener volunteer, Sharon Yarbrough, who has had a lot of success growing containerized uh, carnivorous plants. And so she's going to teach us all about how to do it ourselves and have a nice little garden and that keeps the flies away from your picnic. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if get them all or not. <laughs> But thanks for having me today, and I welcome each one of you today. And uh, my goal today is that you can go out now, if you like this, and shop for them and know what you're doing, and that you could come home and know exactly how to grow them. And I've tried to put most of what you know on a handout so you won't have to be writing all the time that I'm talking. Um, could I ask how many of you already grow carnivorous plants? Okay, great. Okay. Um, when you go to your nursery, we hope that you get a certified one because you can pick these plants up almost anywhere and sometimes they're very hard to get to live, so I would be aware of that. And if you're getting a pitcher plant, I try to make, I'm a very simple person, I try to make this simple for you. If you're going to buy a yellow or a green pitcher plant, you will look for Sarancinia flava. And, uh, we used to have one of those in the garden, but it didn't survive, and I'll try to tell you why in just a minute. And then if you're looking for a pure red, and I think there's some, just some beautiful ones of those out there, you'd look for Sarancinia, Sarancinia purpurea, or Rubra, you'll sometimes see that name with it. And if you're looking for red and white variegation, you will look for Sarancinia uh, leucophilia, and if you want unusual colors, because there's some that blend those together, copper and red, I think is a real pretty combination, you would look for Sarancinia Catesby eye. And I found that to be helpful, because I'll go in and look at these Latin names, and I'll think, what does that mean? So this is as, as simple as I can make it for you. And you can look for these as I go through the PowerPoint because I think I've got pictures of all of them. Okay, she said, I'm Sharon Yarbrough. This is my 11th year being a master gardener and it's been a lot of fun. We've got a great leader. I don't know what that's about because I didn't do animated. <laughs> okay, um, when an animal eats a plant, it is not particularly interesting. But when a plant eats an animal, that is very fascinating. And this is a uh, picture that I took at UNC Charlotte uh, two or three years ago. I know some of you are going on a field trip there uh, in a very soon, so... To me, it's just one of the prettiest places I've seen for a carnivorous plant. And I think they're fun to grow, and I know with my grandchildren, they love to go out and, and to plant them and to go out and look at them and see what they're doing and feed them and do things like that. So anyway, I think they're a lot of fun. And this is one of the best botanical gardens that I have been in. There are 450 different species of carnivorous plants in the world. And they're found on all the continents except for Antarctica. Uh, there are recorded victims, however, uh, 150 types of insects. They like spiders if they can get them, mites, snails, slugs, earthworms, small fish, amphibians, reptiles, rodents, and birds. And I would imagine that bird would be very, very small, and you know, that probably doesn't happen too often. I would say that the main thing that they like to eat would be the insects. And we like for them to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the habitats are endangered. And as I said when I started the presentation, pur purchase your plants from a reputable dealer. Um, and most of your pictures are going to be less than one foot tall. And that's where they grow. This is, of course, in North America. 
and our native habitat for the Venus flytraps is in southeastern North Carolina and eastern North Carolina. And I bet there's some of you that have been there. I live there. You live there? Live well, how there. wonderful. That is great news. And I know Ann's been there. Right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and this is where the fly traps grow. And I think we should sort of be proud that, you know, we have a few in our state. And according to my understanding, that's the only place in the world that they grow in a natural habitat. Never harvest a fly trap from the wild. They are endangered and they are protected by law. You could be facing a fine or a jail time, and I don't think any plant on this earth is worth going to jail for. <laughs> <laughs> and they will vary in size and appearance, and this is the type of traps that I was able to come up with. Snap traps, pitfall traps, suction traps, flypaper traps, and lobster pot traps. And I'll probably only be really concerned with a couple of those today because you could go on a long time with it. Uh, carnivorous plants are insectivores. They secrete enzymes that digest the insect and turn them into a digestible dinner. Do not feed them raw meat as this will cause them to die. What's this a picture of here? Is this a pitcher plant? That is a pitcher plant. That's Dana's Delight and I will be planting that one with you in a few minutes. And that will go in, into Arbogate after we're finished mm -hmm. so that the public can see that. That to me is one of the prettiest ones, and I would say that was the leucophilia over there that I went over. Now somebody did tell me that they give their little, their pitch of plant a little pinch of ham or a little pinch of beef or something, but I don't think that's good information. And this was somebody that sells the plant, so you have to make up your own mind sometimes, but I don't think that's good advice. No, the insects will go to the plants. They have something in them that sort of draws the insects to them. Um, I'm going to tell you in a minute what you do if you've got them inside, because some people just insist in growing them inside, and that way you do have to feed them. But there's a certain way you have to do that. So just hang on a minute. <laughs> they are bog natives, and check the hardiness when you buy them. You know we're zone seven, so look, make sure that they grow in zone seven. I thought bogs were really wet. They are wet. But they really don't like to be standing in the in the water. Uh, it's okay to you know to be damp and wet, but not standing in it. And I haven't been to a bog place where they grow naturally, so some of y'all might be able to share that information. They grow in the green swamp. It's been so long since mm -hmm. I've seen. Okay, well I have seen those, and I've seen them at UNC Chapel Hill in their botanical gardens. That seems to be a natural bog. Duke Gardens, okay. And there are several places in Wilmington that, that have them. You were talking about, you know, they plant with what they're going to jail over. There are actually people that they, they get enough money for it to risk it because they will steal them out of the gardens in Wilmington. But that's so bad for our habitats, mm -hmm. and once we lose them, I mean, they're gone. <coughs> It's a shame. And it's hard for them to get to when they are in their natural habitat because right. that is, that's a swamp. Right. And you know, the ground's kind of iffy and they're alligators right. and other things. <laughs> it's not worth so, it. So not worth it. Is. That, but when they move them and they put them into a garden right. in the Wilmington area, they will go in there and, and steal them. Wow. And they have to keep them under lock and key now. I don't see how stars, they can enjoy them. These star shape are those carnivorous as well? Yes, that's the uh, flower on it. I'm going to try to show you how it grows from when it wakes up at winter and, and what happens after that. It's a little bit later in the, uh, now this is a whole lot like your handout, so you may have read through it, but I'm just going to go through it in case you didn't study it real hard. Keep your, mo your soil moist at all times because it really, if it dries out, uh, you're going to pretty much lose it. And Chris and I w was looking at that first one on the table. I watered that where water was draining through the bottom of it yesterday, and today it's as dry as a bone. So mm -hmm. there's something wrong with, I think, the medium that it's planted in. Because mm -hmm. that's not supposed to happen. But make sure it's about four inches in depth. 
Um, they should be watered with rainwater or distilled water because if you don't, you're going to get all this mineral buildup in it. And you can actually see the white powdery stuff in it if, if you don't watch that. Uh, they should never be fertilized. That should be a plus. <laughs> they love acidic soil. And the soil that I recommend is one half sand and one half peat moss. And after about two years, you'll need to take all of that out and to redo your uh, soil. And make sure the sand is the grainy kind. I went to a place in Mebane that sells sand. They had two great big piles of sand, and neither of them would have been appropriate for this plant. It needs to be grainy where you can get a little air and water in it. I think they call it contractor sand? They do. So it's a coarser. Very pretty sand. I thought, wow, but no good. <laughs> And when you get, no, no, that's what this was. It was contractor sand. And it was two very pretty colors. It was nice looking sand. It looked clean, but it's not appropriate. It may work for a while, but it's not going to do what you want it to do. And I don't use a tail where I buy things, but I bought those at Lowe's and it works very well. And when you get ready to plant your plant, pull up the entire plant. This is when you're replanting it. Wash the plant roots before dividing it. And be careful as the roots are very sensitive. Plants should be placed in indirect sunlight if possible. Now mine stay in direct sunlight and I, I don't think it really matters that much, but you know, anything that is in something very, very hot all the time, it, you may see it take its toll a little bit. <coughs> Drainage holes can be placed on the sides near the top of the container. There should be no drainage holes in the bottom of the container. And that's the first thing I asked Chris today when she brought in the container that I'll be using. Are there drainage, drainage holes in it? And she said, no. I said, well, good. <laughs> but uh, we would recommend maybe if, if you were, don't put, we're going to put this one in the ground, but if, if you didn't, uh, if you did put it in the ground, she might want to drill a hole on the side so that the water doesn't just uh, stay in it all the time. But I don't do plants in the ground, so. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably put a few holes just within a couple inches right. of the top, just so it doesn't stay flooded. Right, because when mine do get flooded, I have to go out and actually turn it over and, and drain the water out, because you don't want them standing in the water. Mm -hmm. And I try to use uh, a rubber but I'm going to show you containers in just a minute. And never use lime on them. This, this container is um, it's just a regular old nursery pot that you can buy at, at any place that sells them. And most of them, you have to drill out the holes in mm -hmm. order to create drainage for any kind of plant except for these kinds of plants. So if, the, so if you get one like that one that doesn't have a hole in it yet, then you can use that for this for your and if possible wash your sand several times I have to admit though I don't do that part and as I said a while ago don't use construction sand use it make sure it's grainy and uh, in the winter after you've gone through that you make sure that you get all the leaves off of it Uh, the leaves should be left on the plant during the winter for insulation. And I'm talking about what grows on it. Cut back the dead leaves and stems in the spring as needed. And this actually was at my house long about February. So this is what you see after they go through the winter. One of the things that I like about them is I just think they're interesting all through the year, not just, you know, when spring comes or summer. Okay, a little later, they start getting the green growth, and I have cut off all the brown on it. Some people go all the way down to the bottom, but I just like to, if I see green, I like to keep it. And most of you would look at that and say, well, don't you think it's time to divide it? And I would say, probably. <laughs> <coughs> and then a little later, you get the, uh, the flower blooms. Do they have seeds in them? They do. I think I've got in here what, what's going to happen with the seeds. This is maybe two weeks later. You can see little they're getting bigger and you're getting uh, petals on them. And the best time to divide pitcher plants is in the fall. However, they can be divided any time of the year except when the ground is frozen. And that's pretty true with a lot of our plants. 
And this is one, this is a Sarancinia purpurea. That's to me one, the reds to me, I just think they just grab my attention. And this is the parts of a pitcher plant. And that's the, the top of it. It works like an umbrella. And that keeps from the pitcher from choking on too much rain. Isn't nature fascinating? Beginning in April, the pitcher plants begin to bloom. This happens before the pitchers emerge, because there's nothing on there at first but, the, but the, uh, the blooms. The time in April depends on the climate and the type of plant. I don't know if you ever have people to ask you, when's that going to bloom? And you think, well, you know, you sometimes you just have to wait and see. That again, that's at UNC Charlotte. The flowers may be yellow, red, white, pink, or burgundy. The stalks will be uh, tall, so insects pollinating the flowers will not get trapped. And I think that's just fascinating. They're way up here above the trap. But if the flower were down here, they would probably fall in the trap. Flowers rise straight up and then bend at the very top, hanging the flower upside down. The blooms last about two weeks. Seeds are released from the fruit in the fall. And then if you wanted to do, uh, I was going to tell you the seeds, the capsule may contain 300 seeds. But the part I didn't think was very interesting is that it takes from three to six years to get the pitcher plant. And some of y'all know that I work with uh, daylily seeds, and I have to wait two years for that, and I think that's a pretty long time. So, th so three to six is just out of the question for me. Bees love the nectar and the pollen in the flowers. Of course, the flower part is called the capsule. And they need, no matter what you do, they need four weeks of cold stratification. Some seeds need that and some don't, but this one is one that does. Even if you put it in a refrigerator, they've got to have that cold for four weeks. This is a white top pitcher plant. And this is richly variegated. That's also a good one to purchase. And I'm thinking that's going to go in the flower category. And that's one that's at my house. And I, I usually do tall ones in the back and short ones in the front, just like when you take a picture. Um, white top pitcher plants avoid eating their pollinators. Um, they attract insects with their color, their scent, and their nectar-like secretions. And inside the pitcher are downward pointing hairs that make retreat by captured prey challenging. And the bottom is filled with fluid containing digestive enzymes. I think most of all of you know this, they don't eat the whole insect, they eat the soft parts of it and the exoskeleton is left in the plant. And that's one of the pollinators. I think that's a pretty pitcher mm -hmm. plant. That's beautiful. Now this is the inside where the insects are. They are attracted to the sweet fluid. The inner hairs allow the insect to travel down the pitcher but prevent it from traveling upward. The plant absorbs the soft parts of the insect and the skeleton remains in the bottom of the pitcher. And if I were working with children, I would actually cut one of those pitchers either horizontally or diagonally and I would show them what those insects look like. So those are digested insects. Those are what's left after they have uh, digested it. Can the insects have disease that would harm the plant? I can't answer that. I don't know. <laughs> okay, and this is of course we know is a Venus flytrap. Fly traps. The only place I know is the native is that little place I showed you on the second or third slide. And they may grow other places, but in the native where they, you know, just pop up, I think that's the only place I've ever heard of.
I don't know anything about this, <laughs> what you did. I I certainly didn't do animation. I didn't do animation when I made it. <laughs> and this, of course, is the best known of the carnivorous plants. And also, somebody told me the other day that if you bought your plants red like that, they were going to stay that way. If you bought them green like that, they would stay that way. But that's something I'd have to study and kind of see for myself because I don't know that I believe that. But I do, like, I do know that when you buy the red that you're getting off to a good start. It's, they're so pretty. And that's the part of, of a Venus flytrap. We have trigger hairs. We have a two-lobe blade la lamina. We have bulbs at the bottom, although they're not very big. And of course, the tiny roots. And we don't understand fully how the flytrap closes. Uh, the Venus flytrap does not have a nervous system or any muscles or tendons. Scientists theorize that it moves moves from some type of fluid pressure activated by an actual electrical current that runs through each lobe. Primary food for the Venus flytrap, the name says it all. The Venus flytrap eats flies and other small insects such as ants. And the trap will shut in less than a second. Lobe manufactures digestive juices and antiseptic juices, and this purifies the prey that is captured. So that may answer your question about diseases because it, it purifies it. The digestive process takes from 5 to 12 days. The time depends on the size of the insect. And then after that happens, the fly trap will reopen to await its next victim, yum. <laughs> And then it'll have white flowers in June, and the stems will be 6 to 12 inches. And if you aren't hybridizing or using those seeds, you probably should take the bloom off after it kind of fades away. And you can replant those seeds. Okay, I'm going to sh show that next in a, in a little bit, not next. And your soil pH would be around 4.9 to 5.3. Just remember acidic, and you'll have that made. All the carnivores? Mm -hmm. All of them, because they don't want you to put a lot of nourishment in the soil or whatever. That's one thing that we like about them, that they, they aren't picky about what you put them in. And they need to be protected. Um, some people may leave them outside and they may grow through the winter and they may come out just fine, but everything that I could read about it says they need to be protected. They will survive in zones 8 through 10 without worrying too much. And then there are the Cape Sundew, and they are covered with sticky red, red tentacles. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking with those, but I will tell you those were hard for me to grow. And I've got one of those that I'll pass around, and you can decide whether you want to do that or not, because if you, you like to do hard things, <laughs> you'll like doing that. Mm -hmm. okay. The insects stick to them. And they're, if you see the sun glowing through them, you can, you can almost see the, the stickiness of it. And then, of course, your insects, your mosquitoes, I bet it would love those. But I just, for me, they were hard to grow. In other words, they died. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you pronounce the uh, Latin name. Mm-hmm. Mosquito. Mosquito. Okay, some of you ask, one of you asked about the germination of the flytrap seeds. I think it's a little bit easier to do these than the pitcher plants. But here's what you need to do. Rinse your sphagnum peat moss four times, poke holes in the bottom and uh, top of the plastic container, and place peat moss in it. Scatter the seeds on top and cover lightly. Spray with distilled water and cover with a lid for about four to six weeks. Place the container in indirect sunlight three to four hours daily. Now that's where they have to leave me out because that's, that's, that's a lot of work. <laughs> the temperature should be between 78 and 90. Soil should never completely dry out. Lift the lid daily and fan the air to prevent mold. 
transplant seedlings with moistened toothpicks. That's a baby. And as I said a while ago, remove the flowers if you uh, are not interested in the seeds. But if you are, this is what it'll look like. Oh, wow. You'll get those in about 7.5 weeks. And most of them start germinating during the second to fourth week. So I can see that that would be interesting to study. Well, I'm going to show pots in just a minute, but that may be one that's not doesn't have much depth to it because I think with the little tiny seeds, you're not going to want anything real, real deep to do it. It looks like a petri dish. It probably, it could be. And they reopen and open about seven times uh, before they fall off. The leaves will turn black and die. And when, when you see that, you'll say, oh, what happened? But that's, that's just part of the natural development. It is not a good idea to play with the fly traps. <laughs> and I had to tell my grandchildren that because they like to get a little weed and poke it so it'll snap together, but it's not a good idea to do that. And they'll do it when you're not looking. <laughs> this is a cobra lily, Darlington, Californica. And I am beginning to like those more. I'm not sure I cared for them at the very beginning. Okay, now we're going to talk a little about the containers. You have to select a, a good container that does not have drainage holes. This just looks like something you could pick up in the nursery. This one also is at UNC Charlotte. I hate to tell it, my son went to school there and graduated and didn't even know the botanical gardens were on campus. Shameful. <laughs> Shameful. <laughs> but he didn't live on campus. Why because you want that moisture to stay in the tub. Okay. <clears throat> and you can just use, this was at Charlotte, I think, and it's just an old tub that's been up and not, no good to anybody. Works fine. <laughs> well, I went, the miner planted in a tub that I got at Tractor Supply that's a, a feeding. Mm -hmm. I think that's in my next photo. Okay, Let's see. Sorry. Well, I'll get to it. So why do the ones need holes on the sides that you put in the ground? Because when it rains, you don't, all that water accumulates on the top and you don't want them standing in water. You just want the, the soil to be moist. You don't want it to be flooding. So you either, I tell you, at my house, I just pour it, I just lean it over and pour it off. But if you don't want to go out and do that every time we have a hard rain, then you, you look at the drainage holes. Those appear to just be ceramic pots. The only thing about those that in the winter, I've noticed that they crack if it, if it gets a lot of snow and ice and rain and things in it. So, And sometimes the paint will peel yeah, off of like it. They have it tilted. So that front one there, the, oh, like how they've got it, a rock over there, and it's tilted to that side to drain the water off. Okay, you could think about that. But do you want to walk around looking at your plants tilted over, though? Well, That's not really, but... <laughs> There's so much going on in that pot, though. I'm not sure that if it's got a little water on top, that it's going to matter that much. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that with the galvanized uh, steel bucket or the plastic, you can drill the holes. Right. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. That's what I did. Yeah. <clears throat> well, when we went to uh, Duke Gardens, they had, that's how they had their bog garden planted. And I had mine in a plastic container like that, which was cracking And after a year or so. And so I thought, there's what I'm going to do when I get back home. And that's what I did. And it's been there for several years now. And it's working fine. Right. And I have the holes. I, I think I have four holes drilled around, you know, close to the top about you yeah, from the top. Okay. And then that's the bottom is closed in. Yeah, that's a good idea. What I read well, said do it. I saw it at New Garden. What I read said four or five <coughs> inches from the top. So if, if you're working mm -hmm. it up here and it works fine, I'd say well, that, I, I okay. think actually what I, I have is like a, a little pattern. Right. Going all around, right. and the holes are probably about that. Right. That but I use rubber pots like this, but mm -hmm. rubber, and I don't have any. I've used them now for years, and I've never had any problems with <coughs> cracking or anything like that. So. <coughs> And I think that's what you were talking about, the feeding trial. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, that's what I had. No. The good thing is you can put right many in there, and they, cool. the 18 or so inches is a good depth to put them in. That seems to be doing well. And there's no holes. It's 
no holes. And I've got some soil up around the bottom of mine just for insulation in the in the winter. And I've got, I think, irises or something like that planted there. Pansies, I know, are there right now. You can plant other plants around them to give them a little shade if, mm -hmm. if you'd like to do that. And some people leave them in the ter terrariums. Uh, but my question is, how can the insects get inside? Yeah. <laughs> and you'll have to feed them. I don't know if I put that or not. Yeah. It's best to grow fly traps outdoors. They need to go dormant in the winter. If you decide to use these containers, they will need two house flies per month. <laughs> And you have to take that little fly and you have to move it around. You can't just pop it in there because you've got to hit at least two of those trigger hairs oh, wow. or it won't go back up snapping. Does it have to be a live permanent? No, it does not. Okay. <laughs> um, I think either way, but it's really hard to catch a fly and <laughs> it stay alive anyway. Well, but just it move it around. Easier. I never have had a lot of luck with these uh, containers. I have tried it several times. I just, I didn't feed the plant, so that may have something to do with it, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's got all that stuff in the bottom. I thought that should take care of it. <laughs> I starved them to death. And you can make a container. I love these little rock, rock containers. They look pretty in the garden, Chris. <laughs> Like it's <laughs> you can get on that. This is at UNC uh, Chapel Hill. And they've got them all mixed together, and I think that's such a good combination. That one's back at UNC Charlotte. But I like the container. That's easy to do. And this is a hypertufa. So I know some of you know how to make those. Yeah. Every one I've ever made cracked, and it didn't last very long, so it's just easier for me to, to get something else. But I thought that was one of the prettiest ones I've seen. This again is at UNC Charlotte, fantastic greenhouses. You'll just say, wow, if, if you what ever. What is this called? Hypertufa. You can make it. Mm -hmm. It's on the internet. Here. There's a formula. Mm -hmm. They do a port in some air. Yeah. We've had one or two classes on how to make those. This is at my house. That's uh, Dana. Hmm, maybe 10. But you know they're not cheap. Um, and I'm going back to Dr. Larry Millenchamp. If you haven't seen his book, it's a good book to purchase with native plants. Uh, and he's introduced a, a carnivorous plant called Dixie Lace. And uh, I'm interested in seeing how that grows. It's not the prettiest one, but it seems to be very hardy. But I thought y'all needed to know what he looked like. <laughs> Uh, and he's retiring this year, I understand. And here is a uh, picture growing in the native habitat. Now this is for people that are growing them in their yards, and I don't have any experience with that, so uh, I would say uh, in your yard can be planted directly in the soil, but survival is unlikely. Sorry. <laughs> You can buy a tub that can be used in, a, in an aquatic pond, and they suggest doing one that's at least 18 inches deep. Or you can dig an 18-inch hole and, and line it with uh, things that you would use in water gardens. And that would, that would be my recommendation if uh, you ask me. You can st it'll still be in your yard, and you don't have to worry about a lot of maintenance with it, but you can put that peat moss and sand in it that's going to keep it going a good while. And they should not be sitting in water. I've been over that a time or two. You have any questions about that? Now, some of you all saying, I'm growing them in my yard. They're in a wet place, and they're doing fine. So, you know, your advice is not wanted. But I think over a period of years, you're going to see that they're not going to be happy. But we'll see. That story continues. <laughs> and this is a sundew. There again, I had a hard time growing those, but they do attract and you know, take care of the insects. They have hair-like structures or tentacles. The tips have dewy drops. These tips are thick and sticky like a spider's web. Tentacles wrap around the insect to prevent it from escaping. 
fair game. They have to be protected in the winter. And this is pronounced Dana's Delight, but that's not the way I spell Dana. I did ask the lady at the nursery, how do you say that name? She said Dana, so I'm going by what she said. And this is the yellow trumpet. That's one I'll be planning in just a minute. I think that's one of the easiest ones and prettiest ones to grow. What is down there, that gray thing? The gray tag? I put the names of my people come to my yard and they say, you got tags everywhere. That's true. Okay, Okay, now I picture it. There's a mixture. That's in your yard? No, no, no. I can't grow a sundew. I've tried. There it is where it wraps around the insect. They're interesting, but you know, that's magnified. That's not, you know, real, real big. It almost looks like a plant. Mm-hmm. If you really, really like to take a lot of time with your plants, you might enjoy it. Or like taking care of a child. It's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> that was enough work. And there's also the brother wart, but I, the best I can tell, this is more of a house plant. Uh, but they seem to like the mosquitoes really, really well. Well, the mosquitoes <laughs> like it. Yeah. Probably both well. Okay, but it's a tropical plant, so that means that you're going to have to treat it a little differently. Now, I've got to tell you about this one. This is a true story. <laughs> This is also a carnivorous plant. It's called a nepenthes, and it grows in like tropical places. And I went to a nursery not too far from here because I like that plant, and I bought it. And I went to the internet, and I thought, what do I do to take care of it? And here's what the internet told me. You gotta have bright sunlight, not direct, never dry out completely. Use rainwater or distilled water. It needs a humid environment. It needs some shade. Uh, If it's less than 50 degrees, bring it inside. It needs sphagnum peat moss and 40% perlite. Do not put it in a clay pot. Add water to the cups. That's the little things like this. Gotta put water in there, make sure it's at least uh, an inch, to about three fourths of an inch. Uh, Prune the green stems and it can live many years if given proper care. <laughs> I went outside and I looked at my monkey cup and I said, you might as well go and die. <laughs> Do you know in the summer how many times the water evaporates out of that? I said, and it did, it died after a year. But I saw that at UNC Charlotte. You know, sometimes you go into a nursery and you say, I just gotta have that plant. But what you should do is read about the plant and then purchase it if you think you want to do all that for it. And that's what they teach us in the Master Gardeners. Always know something about the plant before you buy it. Then uh, I'm going to end up by using a quote from Tony, Tony Avent. Plant them in the garden, sit back and enjoy the carnage as insects check in but don't check out. <laughs> and I appreciate your attention. Are there any questions? Because if you got so, about it's self-sufficient, it, it'll attract enough insects. And the yeah, there's the something bugs. in that flower that just you know it'll right. so attract the bugs. You, you just you sit back and enjoy it. If you get if you can get it to live in your yard. <laughs> okay. Yes. Where's a good place to purchase them around here? Sometimes yellow jackets are. I'm not sure we're allowed to do that. Chris, am I allowed to recommend places to buy these? Absolutely. Okay. Tony Avent, the one that I ended up with, he has a good selection. Tony Avent. Avent. Plants to lie in Raleigh. These came from Cure Nursery, and I want to say their address is Siler City. Yes. Where, what's the name? Cure, C-U-R-E, Nursery, and it's on the internet. You have to make an appointment. Now, if you've never been down in the boonies before, <laughs> you're going to say, where am I? Because you go 
several miles in very, I, I call it isolated uh, territory. You can get lost. <laughs> <laughs> the name of that again was Cure, C-U-R-E. Is that what we went last? It is, it yeah. GPS. It? Yes, it'll yeah. find it on GPS. Just don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, they do. Uh, niche, N I N I C H E. N I C H E. That's Chapel Hill. That also is sort of isolated. <laughs> you have to go down in the woods. I saw. The niche gardens, which are just Chapel Hill. Niche, N-I-C-H-E. They're right there, just out of Chapel Hill. That's probably the place. Any other places? Yeah, that's where they sell them at the plant sale at the Botanical Garden. Okay, that's correct. And they even at UNC Charlotte uh, have certain sales during the year. What is that place that sells the dog food, like Plant Church? I don't know, because I don't live in Alamance County. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Well, I worked there for a while. They had some. Okay, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. They don't know anymore. Okay. Oh, what's the plant garden? Well, I killed them all, I guess. There was a vendor at the farmer's market last year selling these fly traps. Okay, and I know Big Bloomers have the Big Bloomers has the fly traps. Big bloomers in Sanford. Okay, now this came out of the nursery like this, and I left it like this so that you can see what you're buying. I don't know exactly why these are falling down, except I told you I think the soil is just, just not okay. But if you got those, I would cut all the brown off of them. Some people cut them all, back, all the way back to the base, but I say if you've got some green, leave it. I probably would just go and cut these too because they're leaning over. And I was treating them nicely. I'd probably cut that bloom off. Okay. And of course, the Venus fly traps don't require a whole lot, but if I were planting this, we're not going to do this in the big pot. I would probably leave at least half of this. Uh, soil or whatever on it. I just wouldn't pull it out of there, but leave, you know, you plant all of it if you think it works. And what do you put on underneath the soil? Okay, you got your one half peat moss and one half sand. This is a sand to peat moss. You mix it all together and wet it really, really well before you plant anything. And this one is Dana's Delight. You saw that in the PowerPoint. These seem to be a little crooked, and I can't really explain why, because usually they go pretty straight. Okay. Okay, you got your, your big pot, and what do you remember about the bottom of it? No holes. <laughs> Look, Ma, no holes. Um, and I came in a little bit early this morning, and I have mixed it up to about right here, because I know y'all want to sit there and see me do this for about a half an hour or so. And it's, it's really wet and messy looking, but that's what you're going to want. And Ann was telling me this morning I should have a mask on when I do it. And I'll have to start remembering that. Dust. Is it carthogenic? Is that what? No, it's just you don't, you don't need to irritate. Oh. You know. Well, see, I live in the country and we're always dusty. Yeah. <laughs> but that was a lot of dust. I'm thinking the older your peat moss gets, the dustier it gets. But anyway, you want one of these, then you want to go over and get one of sand.
And I use a, you know, put a couple, mix it together, and get it wet. And, just, and I thought just did it all the way up. I have put two gallons of water in here already. I had to use this water. I didn't bring enough rainwater today. You can't always get it exactly. And my grandchildren like to do this part. <laughs> and then their mamas fuss because they're dirty. <laughs> what did you do to my child? They're washable. You wouldn't think so sometimes. Oh, that's on TV. Ooh, I'm in trouble. I forget he's back there. You have to watch what you say. And I'm looking at that. That probably should have been cut off, too. You like that? Are they always curved? Oh, yeah, I love, I love um, curves. That Dana's Delight is a good one to get. So this is taking a little while to get prepared, but it's, it's wet, it's damp. You can kind of hold it together. And you not want it to bring it all the way to the top. You always want to leave at least an inch from the top. So, unless you're going to plant it in the ground. Okay. I mean that's fine. Because I don't put pots in the ground, so well, I just don't have that experience. It can be flush. Okay. Put the it might be better to have it that way, but you can tell this is root bound. It's hard as a brick. Wow. You want to get rid of it. I don't think she's going to like it getting rid on her table, though. I would take as much of that off as I could because it's done its due. It's, it's not happy. You could. When you buy them, most of the time you're just going to get one, just one little thing. And I didn't talk about their pricey. <laughs> this plant at Cure Nursery would be $25. But if you treat it light, right, it will live and do fine. No, these are from Cure. Oh, and they're that root bound. Do mm -hmm. the nurseries ever sell them by the seeds? Not that I know of. Oh, look, there's an earwig in there. They're in everything. Oh, and it's I hate terrible. Earwigs. They're terrible this year. There's a bug in there. Yeah, there's an earwig in there. I even noticed them in my dog's water this week. Mm. And I, I thought of all the places. Up. I bet if you get some pitcher plants, they would eat them. I would imagine the nursery stays those seeds, and that's what they're selling you after a couple of years. Uh -huh. But you personally don't do it. You don't keep the seeds. I'm not going to wait six years for a pitcher plant. <laughs> See, I work with daylily seeds, and that, that's a, a lot to keep up with, and that takes me two years. And I can't do it but so much and look after grandkids. And just keep adding the uh, peat moss in the sand until you get all the way up to the top.